Hello everyone, this is Dave Lewis. Welcome to another special edition of Apologetics from the Attic 2020 Holy Week. Um, and this is Maundy Thursday. Maundy Thursday. Let's open with the prayer in the Book of Common Prayer for Maundy Thursday. Almighty Father, whose most dear Son, on the night before he suffered, instituted the sacrament of his body and blood, mercifully grant that we may receive it in thankful remembrance of Jesus Christ our Savior, who in these holy mysteries gave us a pledge of eternal life, and who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Now as we've been doing, uh, let's do an update real quick on the COVID-19 situation in our country. So the latest UK Daily Mail. U.S. coronavirus death toll hits more than 14,800 after a spike of 1,887 fatalities in 24 hours. As peak day of April 12th, when 2,200 Americans are predicted to die, edges closer. Um, so if you're watching, here's the chart. And we've been going over this chart for the last five, six days. Um, here's uh, where we are. We were 1,799 deaths uh, yes, uh, day before yesterday, and now 1,887 yesterday. Uh, there's the new infections. Uh, they, they go up and down, but they continue to trend upwards. Um, now, you know, the, the debate going back and forth is this modeling um, that, you know, it's they're saying the modeling is getting more accurate because more data is being fed into it. But, of course, they always have the caveat that this modeling has to do with the behavior of people. So if people continue to stay at home, continue to stay away from each other, uh, this will, the cases will peak at certain point, deaths will peak, and then they will start to come back down. And that's what we're trying to do is have them come back down. Although the, the idea of there being a second wave is, is still kind of something that no one wants to discuss really openly because that's a scary thing that we have to do this all over again in the fall. But anyway, um, I recommend listening to Ben Shapiro and subscribing to his podcast because he, he really goes over this stuff in depth. But the bottom line is we're not out of the woods yet. We're going to still have these high death numbers daily. Um, we're still going to have, uh, I mean, and you know, we're insulated from it because we just see it on the news. But um, if, you're, if you're a New Yorker right now and you're living in, in, in New York City, man, it's a scary place to live because, you know, you have seven, eight hundred bodies um, being taken out of hospitals every day, put into refrigerator trucks. And it's absolutely just mind-blowing, just mind-blowing. Um, you know, death. And then, of course, you know, the, the economic toll this is going to take is really going to be something uh, to watch out for. Um, so we just need to continue to understand the seriousness of the situation. Um, you know, don't buy into the conspiracy theorists and the people who are saying this isn't a big deal, everyone's overreacting. Now, this thing's pretty lethal. The lethality rate of this, uh, which is really the metric, in other words, how quickly does it kill someone, how progressively does it kill someone, like, you know, versus the flu, I think you're going to see this is a lot more lethal. It produces pneumonia in the lungs and shuts the lungs down a lot quicker than the flu ever has. Um, and that's why it kills people so so quickly. We just don't have a lot of those stats. But, you know, I heard a doctor on Ben Shapiro basically say, if you get put on a ventilator, on the low end, you have on the better on the better end, you have a fifty percent chance of surviving. On the on the worse end, some studies have said you have a uh, twenty or ten percent chance of surviving if you get put on a ventilator. So this is a pretty serious thing. So to our text, so man, I don't know about you, but I'm experiencing day days and weeks and time in a totally different way. I don't know day, the week seems to go faster, but it also goes slower things blend in together. I mean, it's just a, I mean, it's a fog of war kind of cognitive dissonance kind of experience. I think a lot of us are having because things have been changed and then just not knowing how to react and not knowing how to deal with, you know, the news coming out. And is this going to be some kind of apocalyptic scenario? Or are we going to go back to normal? Are things ever going to be normal? I don't know. I'm just, it's a, it's an interesting experience, but we are in Holy Week still. And we've been doing this series since last Saturday. And we are journeying with Jesus to the cross. We are, remember, we we're trying to put ourselves in the footsteps of the disciples. 
as they journeyed with Jesus to the cross uh, to um, experience him being arrested, flogged and crucified and dead and that di- and die. <laughs> um, so this is called Maundy Thursday. And I was doing a little bit of research. What, what the heck is the word Maundy? I'll pull it up here. Uh, good old Wikipedia. So you got to watch Wikipedia, of course, but you know, th- th- this is, you know, this is, um, this is sourced sourced pretty well. So what's what's up with the term Mondi? Now I've heard this before. So a lot of people think that you know, and we don't have to get into this particulars of it's from you know a Middle English, and Old French Mande, and and Latin Mandatum, um, and then the English word we get the word English word mandate, and then they say it's the first word of the phrase Mandatum Novum Do Vobus Ut Diligas. In visitium citis dis delixi vos, I, I screwed that all up, but a new commandment I give to you that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another, John thirteen thirty four. So, and this is in the context, of course, of John 13, as we're going to go over right now, where Jesus washes his disciples' feet. So traditionally, Maundy Thursday, there's a foot washing service where the pastor, the priest, washes the feet of people in his congregation publicly up front. And I've experienced one of these services before. They're pretty powerful. Um, taking on that taking on that role of a servant. The role of a servant. So let's take a look at this. So this is right on the heels, remember, of um, the triumphal entry. Jesus has entered Jerusalem for the final time. He has rode in on a donkey, being proclaimed as the king, and which he is. But remember, the whole point of this is his kingship is not what any of his disciples or any of his followers uh, expected for the Messiah. Um, at this point, they're still not taking on board what Jesus is 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 doing, and you know, and like I said, what's what's the key text for my entire argument? Um, it's um, John twelve sixteen. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about them, and they had done these things to him. So the resurrection. And the 40-day Bible study that occurred post-resurrection, when Jesus uh, walked the earth for 40 days before his ascension, um, must have been a, a Bible study to remember. Because he, uh, but anyway, we'll get into that when when it's when it's proper to do that. But so then, so then he, there's so Matthew, Mark, and Luke. You know, there's material about you know Matthew adds a couple parables. Uh, parables of of judgment and of to to the Jewish people, um, the the parable of the talents and um, he he adds a couple parables and then uh, Matthew Mark and Luke all consistently add Jesus's discourse about the end of the age and uh, the classic passages on eschatology uh, when the end will come and what that looks like and then <laughs> they all move to the Lord's Supper, the celebration of the Passover. So Jesus celebrates the Passover with his disciples. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, there's limited material. We'll look at Luke briefly. There's limited material on that uh, story. John adds tons of material. So it appears that John, 13 through you know, 17 is this extended block of teaching from Jesus when he's spending his last days with his disciples before his crucifixion. And we're not going to be able to, you know, it would be hours of a program to really do this justice. So what what my recommendation is for you, if you're listening or watching this, um, is for the next, you know, today, um, this is what I'm certainly going to do. I'm going to take time to carefully meditate upon um, John chapter 13 through 17 in preparation for Good Friday. Um, and just, you know, how, do, how how would you do that? Can I get some practical advice? Yeah, I mean, I'll carry this Bible around, maybe a pocket Bible if I have to go out. And um, just as I get moments, just sit down or stand or whatever I'm doing and read three verses, five verses, ten verses, slowly, and just consider them. That's all you got to do. There's nothing. There's no rocket science to it. 
and just uh, just get the word of God into your mind and down into your heart. Um, and, you know, as, a, as John Piper's analogy is, is want to say, um, you know, this is the word of God is like the kindling that you need to throw on the bed of coals, which is your heart, which is inhabited by the Holy Spirit and do keep piling the the wood on the fire to create or the coals to create the flame that you need which is the word of god is the wood the coals are the holy spirit and the flame is that passion that we need to have to serve and follow god and by the way while we're on the topic of john piper um he just released a uh, little book he wrote called uh, god and the coronavirus or something like that um, i'm sorry i should give you the exact title if you're listening i want to look it up uh, some hold on somebody texted it to me um it is coronavirus and christ desiring god.org and it's also an audiobook form and it's free so you can uh you can listen to it as well so it's it's classic john piper and his uh his theology applying to the coronavirus okay now let's get into this text now before the feast of the passover when Jesus knew that it was his hour, had, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world, to go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. So this is all, this has been mentioned many, many times in the Gospel of John about Jesus' hour. So the hour of his betrayal, the hour where he is given over to the authorities to be uh, killed. And, and it's said that they could not arrest him because it was his hour had yet, not yet come. So he had been protected uh, by the providence of God up until the point where his hour has now come. And of course, uh, verse 2 tells us the, the means which is used to bring about this hour during supper when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So, and it's interesting to meditate upon this. So, we have Judas, and we have the devil. And the devil has put into Judas's heart to betray him. And then it says, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, arose from supper. Now, that's a powerful statement of Christology right there. So, um, the, the relationship between the Father and the Son. Well, didn't Jesus already know these things? Well, of course, but um, you have to make distinctions between his divine nature and his human nature. And we're speaking about Jesus' human nature here, um, that the Father, Jesus knows this um, in the sense of, being a, a man walking the planet, although, I mean, that's, that's a, you can get into deep mysteries of how uh, Jesus is one person with two natures, 100% God, 100% man, and how do those natures interact in what's called the hypostatic union. Um, if you're interested in that, um, go on to politicsfromtheaddict.com and uh, find my sermon uh, on the incarnation. Uh, it's on the list of my sermons. So he rose from supper. So what did Jesus do? So that statement of verse 3 is also very important to set the context for his foot washing. So, you know, this this Jesus who all things, he, he possesses all things. He, he is ruler of all things. The Father has given him all things. And he is from God and going back to God. So in other words, he's, he's from glory. He's from honor. He's from a place where angels worship and serve him day and night. And he's going back to that place. What does he do in light of that? He rises from supper. He lays aside his outer garments. He takes a towel and he ties it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. So many people have noted this. And if, if you're new to this, this stuff, you know, this is a servant's task. This is the task of... This is not the task of the person who is the master, who is the owner of the house. He does not wash people's feet. So Jesus giving us this great example of washing feet is, 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 is a powerful example of what we should do. And we're going to see that. 
So he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Um, I mean, the emphasis in the sentence, I think, is on the word you. Lord, do you wash my feet? Uh, Peter basically like, no, I'm not going to. So Peter's still struggling with, you know, Jesus is the Messiah who he's seen uh, heal tens of thousands of people, cast out the demonic control the weather, walk on water, feed 5,000, raise the dead, et cetera, et cetera, doing these things. I mean, in his mind, in my, and in my mind too, like someone with this much power, someone with, that is this glorious, someone that, that has this, it, why would he do these type of tasks? And this is the, I mean, this is what uh, the, the example we are to follow, for it to fo- be followers of Jesus. We are to die. We are to die to the roles that we think we should have, the glory we think we should have, the honor we think we should have. So Peter's like, what are you doing washing my feet? Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you don't understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. So once again, wait, but let's not skip past that. Did you hear that? What I'm doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. I mean, that's another key text. The disciples do not understand what Jesus is doing until after the resurrection. But for many of us, we will not understand the function of God's providences in our life, the suffering he places in our lives, until after the resurrection. And that's the whole hermeneutical key to understanding what Jesus has come to do is his resurrection. His his death and resurrection taken together, which his disciples have no framework for understanding the death and resurrection of the Messiah. Uh, you know, the, uh, a, a Messiah dying on a Roman cross is so foreign to them that they're just not understanding what's going on. Then Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Hmm. So now, so now Peter just goes straight for the jugular. You're not going to wash my feet. This is unbelievable. You are the Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the master. If anyone's feet should be washed, it should be yours. And Jesus' response is, if I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Hmm. So, people, the gospel states, one of the gospel principles is that we do not come to Jesus as givers in terms of salvation. We don't give anything to Jesus. He gives to us. He is the gift, and he is the gift giver. I do not earn my salvation. My share with Jesus is not earned by my righteousness, by being like Peter and acting like, you know, well, you, sh- you shouldn't be doing this, and, and I, I don't need this, and I don't need to be served by Jesus, and I should be serving Jesus and I, sh- I can, no, Jesus gives you the gift of salvation, hundred percent, his gift. You contribute nothing to it. You are a receiver, not a giver. Jesus is the giver. He receives nothing from you in the matter of justification, in the matter of being right with God, in the matter of ultimate salvation. Jesus is the giver. You give him nothing. He does it all. And then, of course, Peter has to, uh, you know, take it. <laughs> Peter's got to take it up to the next level. So Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. So let's not just dump the whole thing over my head. Jesus said to him, the one who was bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. And then Jesus takes that opportunity of the analogy of foot washing, water that washes away dirt from the body. Um, as an analogy for what's going on in the room. Um, And he's talking about Judas. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that's why he said, not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If then I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should also do just as I have done to you. For truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, 
nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. So Jesus is teaching them, listen, the kingdom of God is about the greatest, the most deserving of praise and glory, lowering themselves to a menial task. And of course, what is this all pointing to? Once again, the crucifixion. So the ultimate example is Jesus, who is the eternal second person of the Trinity in the glory of the triune God from all eternity, Father, Son, and Spirit. All glory and honor within themselves, all self-sufficiency within themselves, in need of nothing. In the, in the, in the Son, in the, in, in the eternal delights of the Father, worthy of all praise and honor and glory. He steps down from that position in the incarnation in order to suffer death on a cross for our salvation. Talk about being a servant. Talk about stepping out from a position of authority in order to do a menial task like foot washing. The ultimate fulfillment of what Jesus is pointing to is he is going to suffer and die and he is God the very creator of the universe is going to die a most shameful death on a Roman cross for our salvation. And we're going to see that's what he's talking about. And then I love verse 17. Um, A rebuke to us reformed brethren who put a premium on doctrinal knowledge, which I of course do. I think that Part of the weaknesses of the American church is doctrinal knowledge has been um, scrapped because you know oh that's you know we, we just love Jesus we don't we don't care about doctrine but they do have a point if they see reformed people who you know like all, look at all the books I have behind me of all kinds of access to knowledge but look what he says if you know these things blessed are you if you do them now of course this is in the context of foot washing and. Basically, if you know that I'm teaching you that the greatest among you should be your servant, then you need to go ahead and do that. But you could apply it across the board. So we could stack up knowledge all day. Okay, but doing it, that knowledge should lead to action. And in our spiritual lives and in our discipleship, we should, all the things we learn, we should put into practice in our lives. Then he goes on to say, I'm not speaking of all of you, for I know who I have chosen. Interesting. So we have the choosing of Christ, the action of Christ choosing people. Um, You know, many of uh, many of our uh, brethren uh, struggle with that concept, but here it is. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know who I have chosen. But the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. And and it goes back to the tradition of Isaiah. How is Yahweh um, distinguished from the false gods? It's that he can predict the future and he can tell you the purpose of what happened in the past. Um, So, and then of course, you know, the more uh, precise translation of this is just I am. That you may believe that I am the name of God in the burning bush. I'm telling you this. You now, the, I'm telling you this now before it takes place, and when it does take place, you may believe that I am He. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send rece- receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. So once again, this 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 relationship between the Father and the Son that Jesus bangs on about over and over and over and over and over again. That uh, if you have the Son, you have the Father. Um, there's not this separation between the two. The Father and the Son are one. In the sense of not, you know, there's the do- doctrine of the Trinity, but in the sense of believing in the Son grants you access to the Father. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified. Truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. So now he just goes straight for the jugular and tells his disciples, someone here is going to betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter met, motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? 
Jesus answered, It is he to whom I will give this morsel of bread when I have dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered him. Jesus said to him, What you are going to do, do quickly. So, um, he, so the beloved disciple, who many would say is John, the author of this gospel, um, Peter said, Hey man, ask him who, it, who, who, ask him who it is. Let's start, stop playing these riddles. Who is going to betray him? And then, you know, now it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't indicate that Jesus said this loudly enough for everyone to hear. Um, it's, I'm going to dip this piece of bread and hand it to my betrayer. Seems like he didn't say it loudly. It seems like he just said it to John. Because if he said it out loud, then wouldn't everybody have clearly known what the heck was going on? But you could tell no one knows what's going on. So, and then and then what's fascin- what I've always found fascinating about this passage is verse 27, where he dips the bread and hands it to Judas. And then it says, after he had eaten the morsel, Satan entered into him. So, quite interesting. Um, and... Um, how much of this is connected to what we learn in the book of Job, that uh, when God gives Satan permission to to do something, he has that permission. So he, he you know, now that Jesus' hour has come, Satan is no longer kept from um, bringing about the, the human reason for Jesus' crucifixion, which is this betrayal and this desire among the Jewish leaders to kill him. And then he says to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Jesus had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. So it's quite interesting that um, I don't, you know, even in the midst of all this, the disciples still have no clue what's going on. They don't know who's going to betray. Um, I don't know if Jesus whispered that secretly to John when he asked him who's going to do it, or if it was said out loud. But the bottom line is nobody knows what's going on. So Jesus or Judas leaves to go um, plot uh, with to offer to betray Jesus to the Jewish leaders, and they give him money to do so. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God is glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and glorify him at once. So, and this language too about the glorification of the Son, um, and and you know what that looks like, is 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 powerful. And of course, you know the glory that Jesus is speaking of is being hung on the cross. Now, of course, his resurrection is part of his glorification as well, but you can't be resurrected till you die first. So this is this is what you know that he's preparing the disciples to understand that. Wow, he was crucified, but that's what he told us. He told us to take the lowest place. He told and then, and to be counted among the the sinners and counted among thieves and counted as a worthless, uh, you know, impotent false prophet who was cursed on a Roman tree. Wow, talk about servanthood. And that was his glory, because that's what he was teaching us that this is. This is how, this is the glory of God, is to be a servant, is to be least. And that's with the whole point of the foot washing. Little children, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me. And just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. And then here's where we get the term Maundy Thursday. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, so you also are loved to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, what's the shape of this love and this new command? Well, the disciples are about to experience it here in a couple days. They're going to see the the ultimate expression of Jesus' love is to lay down his life and be crucified and killed and die a most painful, horrible way. For the sake of the love of his people. And you know we are to emulate that. As his disciples. We are to be selfless. We are to count our lives as nothing. And worth nothing. And I'm going to tell you. There's so much about my life. That I count as worth something. 
There are so many obstacles in my life that prevent me from truly laying down my life. And this coronavirus pandemic has really put into sharp focus in my life what matters and what doesn't. And what things in my life get in the way of me doing what Jesus is telling us to do right here is to love one another. I was certainly, um, I can see that in my own life and uh, it's, 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 it's convicting. And I pray that for myself and for all of us that when the dust settles on this crisis, that we don't go back to business as usual as a church. We don't go back to, well, let's just live our lives as if everything's going to be fine and nothing's ever going to happen and, and maybe, you know, some bad things happen here and there, but normally the Christian life is just self-centered living, middle-class Christianity, middle-class American lifestyles, just, you know, you know, accumulating for yourself, getting a big house, nice cars, you know, having status symbols of materialism and having status symbols of power and prestige, and that's you know, that mingles in with the Christian life. And clearly that's not what it's supposed to be. Clearly it's supposed to be the opposite of that, like Jesus is teaching us right here. So I really pray that this coronavirus situation uh, brings us to that place. Now I would be amiss, and to be honest with you, I'm tired. Um, I'll just be, <laughs> I'll just be brutally honest. Um, uh, I need a, I need a day where, uh, you know, on Saturday, I think I'm going to take the longest nap I've ever taken in my stick in life. Um, you know, rest for uh, Holy Saturday. Um, Luke, the Lord's Supper in Luke. So I want to, I'd be amiss if we didn't go over the Lord's Supper um, and the Passover feast that Jesus has with his disciples because that's another thing that is meditated on and talked about on a Maundy Thursday. So that's found in Luke chapter 22, verse 7. And same thing as in John. These discussions that Jesus is about to have with his disciples, this is in the context of Judas already agreeing to betray him. Um, so now the Feast of the Unleavened Bread was drew near which is called Passover, and the chief priests and the scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. So the context is what? The Passover feast, if you're not familiar with what that is, go back and read Exodus, uh, starting with chapter 1 all the way through 12, 13, 14, 15, the, you know, the story of the deliverance of the people of Israel from, uh, from Egypt. And the Passover, of course, is where the blood of the lamb, the lamb who was slain, um, is, is placed on the door, post and the the death angel the avenging angel the final plague which is the death of the firstborn uh, that will pass over the house when the blood is seen uh, painted on the door on the outside of the home and the jews celebrated this feast every year to remember their deliverance from their bondage and of course jesus is appropriating this feast and saying this points to me I am the fulfillment of the Passover. I am what it was pointing to all along. Uh, if you're familiar with the term typology, uh, there's types and anti-types. So there's patterns that are set up in the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, that are brought to their fulfillment in the New Testament. Now, I know I'm being very elementary here, but I'm assuming that there's people here, and I hope there's listeners that that are very, you know, new in their faith and, and, and are still just elementary studying the Bible. I don't want uh, this podcast to become highfalutin and nobody can understand it, um, or you have to be an advanced Christian to understand what I'm saying. The Passover is the context, and Jesus appropriates this and says, I am the fulfillment. Verse 3, so, and then, of course, the chief priests and scribes were seeking how to put him to death, for they feared the people. That, so, in other words, they're they're plotting to put him to death but they have to do it in such a way where the crowds don't turn on them and then of course they they find that person in judas because judas basically says i know a place where they go that is private and if you went there at night you could you know well the people are all asleep and the crowds have dispersed you can definitely go arrest him secretly and the crowds won't notice 
I mean, that's what Judas basically offers them is, you know, there's, there's this garden, there's this place that they go um, that privately, and he's going to take them there. Then Satan entered into Judas Iscariot, who was one of the number of the twelve. He went away and conferred with the chief priests and officers how he might betray him to them, and they were glad and agreed to give him money. So he consented and sought an opportunity to betray him to this in the absence of the crowd. So now Judas comes back. It seems like he rejoins the disciples, and he's now a uh, uh, inside plant of the Pharisees and the Jewish leaders and the scribes in order to figure out a way to get Jesus into their hands without a crowd, without a crowd, so to secretly betray him um, in the absence of a crowd. Okay, verse 7. Now came the day of the unleavened bread on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us that we may eat it. They said to him, Where will you have us prepared? He said, Behold, when you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him into the house that he enters and tell the master of that house. The teacher says to you, Where is the guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished. Prepare it there. Now this has always been mysterious to me. Like, are these angels? I mean, who, who are... <laughs> Is it did you know? Is this a is this a miraculous thing, or did Jesus uh, you know go off? Um, does he have some some close uh, you know? He's got some connections with people with money and wealth, and he's already like went to them and been like, hey man, you know, I'm I'm gonna eat Passover here. I'll send my disciples when it's proper and make sure everything's ready. You just don't know. It's, it's, some of these things are interesting to read. Um, who is this man carrying a jar of water? And then who's this master of this house? Who is this guy? How does Jesus know this guy? And how is everything already prepared for him? It's interesting. And they went and found it just as he had told them. And so, so if you're, if you're the, if you're Peter and John, you're like, oh, wow, dude, this is, what, what is going on? How is this already prepared for us? So, and they, and they prepared the Passover meal and, you know, Passover Seder, uh, you know, my wife is going to do one today with the children and we're going to do one. We're going to go through the she's getting ready for, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to look at the Jewish roots of Christianity and, um, how they would celebrate Passover. And it's pretty cool. Like the one thing I remember that I always thought was cool about it. It's been a year since I've done one. Uh, but you know, there's this whole liturgy, um, this whole, uh, you know, things that you say and, and actions that you take while you're sitting around a table. And I just remember one of them is eating a bitter herb. A lot of times people use horseradish but eating something bitter and then the, they're saying it to, to remind us of our captivity in Egypt. And then it talks about the joy of being delivered. It's, it's really cool. Um, and when the hour came, he reclined at table and his apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So once again, he's saying these things. If you're a disciple sitting around the table, here he goes again. Before he suffers. What does that mean? And then he's talking about the kingdom of God. And the fulfillment of the kingdom of God. And what is this kingdom? What's the kingdom look like? You know, this is this is what's going, bouncing around your mind if you're a disciple. Sitting around a table with him. I mean, put yourself in this, these shoes. It's very important. You really get the sense of, of the story when you put yourself in the, in the shoes of them. And don't just look at it as a Christian uh, looking back on this, imagine if you're one of the disciples sitting and experiencing this. What, what do you What do you mean you're going to suffer? You, you're You're the most powerful prophet I've ever seen. You can raise the dead. You can walk on water. You can control the weather. You can heal people with a touch. What do you mean you're going to suffer? And yes, the kingdom of God. I know what the kingdom of God is. Yeah, that's when that's when the Messiah comes and and brings the kingdom of God to earth. And then what ends up happening? He's crucified with a sign above him that says Jesus of Nazareth king of the Jews what, this is the kingdom I mean the, the, the theology of the cross folks the theology of the cross and he took a cup and when he had given thanks he said take this and divide it among yourselves for I tell you that from now on I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes and he took bread and we had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So what Jesus is doing is, you know, and if you do a Passover Seder or watch a Passover Seder, you'll see 
there's all these symbolic actions that are taken, um, you know, eat this and it reminds you of that, do this and it reminds you of this, having to do with the story of the Passover. Well, Jesus is now saying, this is about me. And the breaking and eating of the bread is for you to remember my broken body for you. So now Jesus is the lamb. Jesus is the one whose blood, broken body and shed blood, protects us from the plague of the death of the firstborn, which is a representation of God's judgment. Powerful stuff. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup is poured out for you as the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand... Okay, so let's stop there. So, and then we have this language of a new covenant. You have to understand how powerful that would have sounded to a first century Jew, a disciple of Jesus. To redefine the covenant, the covenant arrangement, the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the covenant that God had made with his people, and to say, I'm bringing you a new covenant. That's radical. I mean, sometimes we just breeze by this. But the fact that Jesus is saying, I'm bringing you a new covenant. There's a new covenant. Powerful. But behold, the hand of him, and it's and it's how it's the covenant established in his blood. So, just as the author of Hebrews shows us that, um, you know, blood, shed blood, um, even in the Mosaic covenant, everything was sprinkled with blood. Uh, so, in his blood, in his death, this covenant is established. But behold, the hand of him who betrays me is with me on the table, for the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. That verse is powerful. Um, if you're familiar with some of the debates, uh, free will uh, versus God's sovereignty, and is, is, is everything predetermined, or do we have free will? Well, there's a verse right there that sets them both side by side. Um, it's called compatibilism is the technical term, meaning that it's compatible for things to be predetermined, yet for us to be held responsible and accountable for the choices we make, yet that choice we make is predetermined. Many people struggle with that, but I think it's the biblical teaching. For the Son of Man goes as it has been determined, but woe to that man who is betrayed. So the first one, of course, it's determined. It's determined. What's that word? I'm just curious what that word is. Um, the the word determined. Um, orizo. Orizo. Um, it's a participial form of orizmo. Orizo. Um, will go as it has been determined. Um, but woe to that man whom is be he's betrayed. So um, there's a curse upon the one who is going to betray him. But that betrayal has been determined by God. Well, that doesn't make sense. Well, the Bible doesn't attempt to reconcile things the way we tend to want to do philosophically. So compatibilism, that's, that's the issue with compatibilism is God does do these things and uh, to, uh, teach these things in the Bible and, and there's no attempt at a reconciliation of the two. And they begin to question one another which one of them it could be who was going to do this. And a dispute also arose among them as to which of them would be regarded as the greatest. So <laughs> here we go again. You know, Jesus has just dropped some pretty deep truth here. He's going to be betrayed and suffer. And there, here they go arguing. And one of them is going to betray him. Like one among, in their company is going to betray him. And then this leads to them fighting about who's the greatest. And then Jesus, once again, is the patient teacher that he is, has to go back to a teaching he's given them. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them and those in authority over them are called benefactors, but not so with you. Rather, let the greatest among you become the, as the youngest and as the leader as the one who serves. For who is great, the greater, one who reclines at table or one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines? It's not the one who reclines at table, but I am among you. Let me read that again. I'd mess that up. For who is the greater, one who reclines at table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at table? But I am among you as the one who serves. So the total uh, reversal 
that the kingdom of God brings in our understanding of uh, leadership, our understanding of, of who is, is uh, you know, so we, people do have influence and people do have positions, but they should use that position to serve. And that's what Jesus is about to do. He's going to give the ultimate example of that. Jesus's position is not only as a simple master of a household, he is God in the flesh. He's the creator of the universe, worshiped by angels. So you can't get a greater position than that. And yet he's the servant. He's going to serve them in such a way that he's going to die on a cross for them. You are those who have stayed with me in my trials, and I assign to you, as my Father assigned to me, a kingdom, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So that's <laughs> that's a pretty powerful statement if you're one of the disciples. Like, whoa, what did he just say? We're going to, where he's giving us a kingdom, and we are going to sit at his table, and we're going to judge the twelve tribes of Israel? Wow. Now, are they even ready for that assignment yet? No, but they will be based on what they go through. So that's where you got to go into the book of Acts and read what the early church experienced and how they were shaped and molded by God's providence and the suffering they underwent, the persecution they underwent. Um, So, yeah, they are going to participate with Jesus in his trials even after his resurrection and ascension. Then look what he says about Simon Peter. Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has demanded to have you that he may sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. What a powerful thing to have Jesus pray for you. Can you imagine? So, and and it sounds exactly like the book of Job. Satan demanded to have you. When? How? How does Jesus know this? I mean, this is this is an, an interesting um, and then I remember reading something about, you know, post-resurrection. That's when Satan, in, in the ascension of Christ, that's when Satan is kicked out of the, he's not able to appear with the angels before the throne room of God, like it seems like he's, he's allowed to in um, the book of Job. But there's a whole other thing. But can you imagine, and I pray, Jesus, that you pray for me, that my faith may not fail. Because Peter, what does he end up doing? He ends up betraying Christ. And we're going to see that in a moment. But but what a powerful... And then you got you got to wonder, you know, compare this with Judas. So, clearly, if Jesus prayed for Judas that his faith may not fail, Judas' faith wouldn't have failed. Judas wouldn't have betrayed him. But we don't have indication that Jesus prayed for Judas. But he prayed for Peter. And I don't know about you, but this is the other thing that why I'm reformed. When Jesus prays something or wants something, he's not going to fail to have his prayer answered. It's just, I think it's just common sense. He's not going to, his prayers are answered always. His intercession for his people is always perfect. Those who Jesus intercedes for before the Father cannot fail to be saved. They, they, they will be saved because Jesus is praying for them. And then Peter's reacting to him saying that his faith is going to fail. Peter said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Jesus said, I tell you, Peter, the rooster will not crow this day until you have denied three times that you know me. And he said to them, when I sent you out with... Okay, so... Peter, Peter is overconfident, self-righteous, thinking that he is going to be willing to do these things. And he's, and he's not. He's going to chicken out. He's going to cower. And he's going to deny that he even has anything to do with Jesus because he's afraid he's going to get arrested and crucified right next to him. Because what better way to stamp out this movement than not only to crucify its leader, but crucify its inner circle too. But Jesus says, Peter, this is part of your process. This is part of the refining of you to be one of my leaders in the church. And then, of course, as we'll see tomorrow, Peter denies Jesus. 
And he said to them, when I sent you out, so Jesus then continues, when he said to them, when I sent you out with no money bag or knapsack or sandals, did you lack anything? They said nothing. He said to them, but now let one of you who has a money bag take it, and likewise a knapsack, and let the one who has no sword sell his cloak and buy one. For I tell you that this scripture must be fulfilled in me. And he was numbered with the transgressors. For what is written about me has its fulfillment. And that's more powerful than people realize if you really get into the study of this. Um, he quotes Isaiah 53. Jesus quotes Isaiah 53 directly and said, this is the fulfillment. I am the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. It's a powerful statement. It's a powerful statement. Go and read Isaiah 53 if you never have and see how a thousand years before these events, it's prophesied that the servant will suffer. And Jesus is taking up that um, and saying, this is, this is, I am fulfilling this scripture. And they said, Lord, look, here are two swords. And he said to them, it is enough. And as he came out and went, as was custom to the Mount of Olives, the disciples followed him. Now, and this is where we get into um, the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus meditating upon the cross and his eventual going to the cross. So I don't know if you got anything out of this episode today. I kind of feel I'm tired and, um, you know, I need to recharge and refresh and but we're in the midst of Holy Week, so I mean, maybe this is in God's providence giving me this uh, experience that the disciples must have experienced, this uncertainty. I mean, it's, it's interesting in God's providence that um, Holy Week is coinciding with uh, the, the highest peak in deaths for this coronavirus. And um, the, you know, that now we're being told we need to always wear masks in public. I don't know if any of you have had that experience yet, but it's surreal to walk around and uh, where I work, we're all wearing masks now up at Teen Challenge, and that's bizarre to walk around and see all the staff wearing masks and all my interns wearing masks and, um, you know, uh, walking in stores and, you know, seeing tons of people wearing masks. It's, it's an interesting. And it's, it's, you know, all these things swirling about us, just as the disciples must have felt as they're approaching Good Friday and they're about to have the most earth-shattering thing that could possibly happen to them happen. This man that they followed, claiming to be the Messiah and gave up their life to follow, he ends up being killed on a Roman cross and laid in a tomb. And it becomes clear that the consensus among the disciples after that happens is, well, he couldn't have been the Messiah. That's not supposed to happen to the Messiah. And even, 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 every, even after everything Jesus taught them, even after every time Jesus said, listen, this is going to happen, uh, they didn't believe him. And then he ends up dying. And that's what we're moving toward, toward Good Friday, toward the remembrance of the death of Jesus for our sins. But I want us to, you know, be as the disciples. And this is the whole point. We're supposed to be devastated. The great hope that started on Palm Sunday is dashed to pieces by Good Friday. That's the, that's the rhythm that's supposed to be instituted by this Holy Week. And I think that uh, many, for many of us, that's the rhythm we are, we are in because of this coronavirus. And I think that this is where the scripture is such a powerful, the word of God, the holy word of God, and the, the sacred history of, of what happened to Jesus is, is, is so powerful at this time. So thanks you for joining me for another edition of Apologetics from the Attic. And I'll see you again tomorrow. God bless. <music>